All right. Good morning, everyone. Okay, we're going to we plan on going back to, in the series that I was going through, Corinthians. I took a little break there and, and uh, preached some other messages I felt was necessary. I hope it was a blessing to you, but I want to go back and finish uh, chapter 15. I preached this uh, a while back on the re- about the resurrection. It's mostly on the resurrection, but there is some other stuff we can pull out of there as well. And if uh, there's enough time, we'll maybe make it through 16. But or as of now, let's take your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Paul goes on to say, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Pete mentioned in prayer that, you know, that we stand on truth. You know, sometimes churches start out good, sometimes Christians even start out good, but um, <clears throat> it doesn't always uh, stay there. You get tempted along the way, or it seems like either people want to go religious or they want to go liberal. And you see it more in young people, they're always tempted to go more liberal. They want less rules, less regulations and less boundaries. And so the temptation for younger people is, uh, is to go more liberal. That'd be probably a problem in this church. We'd want to go very liberal. But with the older generation, they're very tempted because they come from a really strict background that they're always trying to push maybe, let's push more laws, more rules, and don't let people do this. And, you know, take the high road. You'll hear, hear something. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. I'm not talking down that. What I'm saying is there's got to be a line on both sides. Sometimes we're preaching and it seems like we're tearing down uh, law and works, and, and when it comes to putting that into your salvation, that that's part of your salvation, then, then absolutely we're going to take that away and say, no, no, it has nothing to do with salvation. So many religious churches, if you think of a religious church, they will add works to salvation, or they'll add works to keep themselves saved. So many, this is where many will struggle. They'll, they'll get saved, say, it's grace alone. Thank you for God's grace. I couldn't have done it myself. But then Okay, now they think, okay, I'm in control of this horse now. I got the reins, and now I got to keep it. Got to keep it on track. I got to stay on the narrow path. Remember, Jesus talked about narrow is the way. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to heaven. So we think narrow as in you got to be narrow, religious, very precise in what you do. Make sure you don't fall off. It's very easy to lose your salvation. And that, too, is a very dangerous, false uh, perception of the gospel that somehow Christ can't keep you in the faith. you got to keep yourself. But nonetheless, I'm not a Calvinist. A Calvinist is all, they would have the doctrine of once saved, always saved. But I would preach security of the believer, which is the next best thing, let's say. And it's going to come across as, so you're saying once you're saved, you're born again, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, there will nothing come in your way. You will go to heaven one day. 30 years from now, you will die and you'll go to heaven. Yes. You say, well, yeah, then you're one of those once saved, always saved. Okay, label me however you want. But I have security in Christ. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit. I am confident I'm going to heaven when I die. I know where I'm going. If I had to control the horse, make sure I stay on the narrow path, I would not know that. I would not be able to say that boldly right now. I would not be able to say that. How could you? Because now it's, I haven't lived the next 30 years if, Lord willing, I live another 30 years or the rapture doesn't happen or whatever. I'm still, then it's up to me, right? But nonetheless, you will see Paul saying, okay, the Corinthian church, they started out well. And he says, you stood on this gospel. I came and preached to you guys. A bunch of you guys got saved. And he says, you guys stood in this. You said you believe what I preach. He says, it's wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. So if you stand this gospel, you believe it. He says, but the condition. Now, this is where the once saved, always saved crowd really wants to ignore that the Bible says there's more passages like this. And it's, and it's complicated to teach it. It'd be easier to just kind of push these verses aside. But they are there. And if you're going to be a Bible believer, you got to take the warnings of loss of salvation. There is a condition to your salvation. You say, what's the condition? If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Clearly, belief was how they got in to the faith, and they were stopping believing something, right? So you say, if you could lose your salvation, how could you lose it? Most people want to look at somebody who start drinking and maybe partying and just kind of going off the deep end like that. That guy's losing his salvation. 
Scripturally, if somebody loses salvation, let's hypothetically, let's say, loses salvation, how would you do it? You would have to stop believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work, him dying on the cross for your sin, and him raising up from the dead. Now, these believers, it says they believed and they stood. You say, were they saved? I don't know. The scripture doesn't, he says, look, you stood in this though. You said you believed this. He says, but look, if you don't keep in memory, if you don't go on believing that doctrine that got you saved, if you don't believe it to the end, then you can't be saved. So salvation is an ongoing thing. It's not this one-time altar call, I accept Jesus Christ. I made a profession of faith. I accepted him as Lord and Savior and I asked him for, to forgive all my sins. And so, and he did it and, oh, I feel so good since. And okay, now it's a one-time thing. Now just, okay, what's next? Now I'll just go live life again, kind of like what I used to always do. And that's not what salvation is. It's got to be a, a mindset change. If your heart and mind hasn't changed, if you don't have a new perspective on life, then it didn't work. Whatever you're trying to get, like, in other words, did I get saved? Did it work? You can know if it worked or not. Are you still in it? Do you still believe? Are you still trusting? Is that what you're relying on from day to day, ongoing? See, why I'm confident in my salvation, because I'm confident I'm going to believe in Lord Jesus Christ until the day I die. And then, after that, I still believe. <laughs> but it'll be easy. But I mean, I believe, I trust him. And since I got saved, I've never not trusted him. But then I've gone to churches where they start to preach like, if you're doing this, you're doing that, and you're listening to contemporary Christian music, then then you must not be saved. Then I started doubting and I started, because somebody was messing with my mind and messing with the doctrines and I was a new believer and it's very easy to do that to new believers. And then you start bringing in doubt and stuff because of bad doctrine. Because of really bad doctrine. So these guys had some bad doctrine. Guys came in and you see the Corinthian church had all kinds of problems. They had, I mean, it's filled with just problems and issues going on. And Paul's dealing with them. And now we're at the end of 1 Corinthians and he's saying, some of them don't believe in a resurrection. He says, how is this possible? And this is what he's building up. He says, by which you are, you are also are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So you can originally believe in vain. In other words, it was useless. It never did anything for you. It, it would have been salvation if, if that would have been a lifelong decision, let's say. And you would have stayed in that. So yes, it sounds like sal- uh, you can lose your salvation. It sounds like there's a condition of salvation. And, and as far as scripture says, I agree with it. I have no problem with it. it doesn't, this doesn't affect my security of the believer at all. I'm aware that if I just go now and change to Jehovah Witness doctrine, I just, oh, Jesus is not God in the flesh. And I just totally change. I know that, uh, that I wouldn't be saved. I know that. So I don't believe in this. Once saved, always saved as my decision I made. You know, back then, that's just, doesn't matter. If I just totally not believe that in the future, I'll still be saved. Oh, no, I don't believe that. But I believe that if somebody truly comes to the faith, truly sees who Christ is, has tasted God's goodness, is sealed by the Holy Spirit, I don't see how they just leave it, just pack up and leave. I see religious people do it all the time. You see someone like Judas, who was a thief all along. He looked good on the outside. He fit in. He deceived everybody. But the Bible says he was a thief all along. He was stealing from the purse because he was, he was carrying the money bag. He, was a th- he loved money. He betrayed Jesus for money. I mean, and it, it tells you later that he was crooked all along. So there's people that are a Judas all along, but we don't know it. And then later we say, well, maybe they lost salvation. No, they were a Judas. They never had salvation. Judas never had salvation. He was never saved at any point. Think about it. It's prophesied he was going to go. There was going to be somebody that was going to betray him and go to hell. He was never saved at any point. He did not lose his salvation. So I think many cases are like that. And I leave it at that. He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, this is interesting how he says, according to the scriptures. You say, according to what? So, where do we get our facts from? How do you know? How do we even know Jesus Christ died for your sins? How, what are you relying on? Well, so-and-so said. I heard a good video. It just made sense. 
Well, that could be a very shallow belief. Later you'll hear a good preaching on a Mormon and you'll convert to that. See, when people have a shallow belief, they just follow men. They can be a Christian for a while, but just like that, a Jehovah's Witness comes to the door and he seems a little nicer than his Christian friends and say, this religion seems more real. I've seen people, nowadays it's getting pretty popular, the Muslim faith. They say, man, like you look at people that follow the Quran, they people that, I mean, they're dedicated and they are. If I was looking at that, as far as if I was looking at works, I think they do a whole lot a better job in their faith than Christians today. In other words, they're keeping up, they're living more what they preach than probably most Christians. But see, I'm not basing on, you know, how devout or how um, zealous they are in their faith. You could be so zealous, doesn't make you any more right. Paul was so zealous as a Jew. It made him dead wrong. He was a murderer and murdering Christians and stuff. Later, we see him very zealous in the Christian faith, and that's good. But sometimes it's not like that. But he says, it's got to be according to Scripture. We have prophecy. We have, I mean, we have from the Old Testament, everything prophesied that Jesus would come and die, and there's facts, there's proofs. Now, in Paul's day, there was even more. But he's starting off with Scripture, and that's all we have today. We really, all we have is Scripture now. We can't go and talk to somebody who was there when Christ died. But in Paul's day, there, are still, there was people still alive. So there was like a double proof. But first things first is according to Scripture. Everything's got to be according to Scripture. If you don't have authority in the Scripture, then you have no authority. You're relying on man. It, that's the only thing that's left. I would say this. Some of you probably use even different Bible versions, and I don't want to tear you down. But I'm saying this. There is a great big study you can do on this kind of stuff. And I'll tell you, if you just think, I just want you to think on this kind of stuff, if you're okay with just any version. Look into it just a little bit. You'll find no time that the Bibles contradict. Actually, with an NIV, I can catch spots that con contradicts itself. It literally contradicts itself. And they've messed up that bad in some of these areas. Is all of it corrupt? No. But uh, there's areas... And then you go back into Greek and say they took this off of Greek. They took uh, words like flesh and turned it into sinful nature. Never in the King James Bible has that ever, ne nothing about sinful nature. It's a common belief nowadays, so they put it in the new Bibles. And then they've taken flesh, which is the word sarx in Greek, and they've changed it into sinful nature, some of these new translations. It was never in the Greek like that. Maybe a few corrupt ones, but the majority of the Greek where they say take it from wasn't even in there. You could do stuff like that and say, okay, these translations, now, I would use even other translations. Sometimes if I'm confused, I'll take it like a commentary. I'll take a translation, and I'll look at it and say, how, how do they say it? Oh, that's actually pretty good how they say it. And you know what? That still works. Still true. I can see that. I'll still do that. But you'll see, what about when it's been tampered with and it's wrong? I mean, if something goes, let's say, completely against this King James Bible, either this one's in error or the other one, if they say something completely different let's say something like opposite, the one of them is wrong. So think about it. Where's the authority? Is King James the authority or is NIV the authority? Say, well, we don't think it that far. Have you ever thought it that far? Where's the authority? What if I say according to scripture? Because I had a guy one time I said, I told him there's no such thing as sinful nature. He says, well, my Bible says there is. I'm like, okay, then I guess whatever, check your Bible. You know, what, what am I going to say next? He says his authority says there is a such thing. And I say, my authority says there's not. Our authority comes from different... Where's Paul's authority? I mean, Paul just says, according to Scripture, and I'm supposed to be like, hey guys, here's proof. According to Scripture, this is how it is. Today, we can't even do that. I'll say, hey, according to Scripture, there's no such thing as sinful nature. And you'd say, well, my Bible says there is. Well, then either I'm wrong or you're wrong, but I mean, are we going to resolve it? Are we going to figure it out? Are we going to do more study? Or are we just going to say, no, I'll just believe what I believe. You do you, I do but I, you know, I believe. That's what people, and they go on in deception. And then there's nothing we can do as far as getting people on the right track or even getting me on the right track if, if this Bible's been tampered with. See, that's the thing. You've got to have a scripture that you trust. If you can't trust scripture, then you can't trust your authority. What are you left with? Smart people, wise people. You're left with, my Bible college told me this, my professor says this, and it made sense because he put this and this and how this works and that works. And they're so wrong. <laughs> There's so many things that are so far wrong. 
Christianity has become this sissy gospel today, guys. Seriously, it's not the gospel of Paul, like Paul preached. It became a, a very effeminate, sissy gospel dying to self. And we're going to talk about this kind of stuff. It's all, it's all in here. And Paul, you know, deals with this kind of stuff. And people misquote scripture and say, well, you know, my Bible says it like this. And, and it's just dead wrong. We'll cover some of this stuff. And I'll show you. But when you say according to scriptures, when I say according to scriptures, I mean the way it says it. If it says it like that, it means that and nothing else. And that's just how it is. And that's authority right there. He says, according to scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to scriptures. So he's saying this resurrection was, it's recorded well in scripture. He says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Now, when a Christian dies, it's called falling asleep. Because you have eternal life. We actually just dropped this body. It's absent from the body, present with the Lord. We don't really experience death. You know, we still call it death, and that's fine. But the scripture will do this because there's a big difference between a Christian dying and an unbeliever dying. An unbeliever dies and only gets resurrected at the judgment to actually go be thrown into torment again. Longer and forever and cast aside. I mean, he just goes from one death to another death. But we, that's why it's not even really death, because... We drop this body and we're very much alive somewhere. Instantly. Like you would blink, you're dead. And then, I mean, instantly you're, you're, you're in the presence of the Lord. Your spirit. And then you wait for a body. The resurrection is waiting for a new body. And it's a, it's a body with a few extra features than we have now. Very awesome features. Different. It's a glorified body. He says, there, he says in Paul's day, he says, there is people right now. There was 500 that seen Jesus at once. So they weren't hallucinating. Nobody would, there were, you could never get 500 people all to just agree on a lie. He says, you could go talk to, he says, a greater part of these people are still alive. You can go find them and their story will match. So that was a huge proof. I would love it if I had a proof like that today. And if I could say that, hey, you don't believe in the resurrection, go talk to so-and-so, talk to so-and-so. There's a bunch of people still alive who were there, who seen it. Who's seen him after he rose from the dead? He says, after that he was seen of James, then of the, all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also. This was on the road to Damascus. So uh, Paul seen Jesus. He says, as of one born out of due time. He says, for I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Now, this is interesting. I had to think of this when I was studying this yesterday. And, you know, all of us could say this. You know, you're saved today. If you stop and think, like, who would you be if you wouldn't have got saved? Where would your life have gone if you wouldn't have got saved? For many of us, we would see it as, man, I think a marriage would be a wreck. There'd be a lot of things that would be terrible. I'd look at it and, and I was just, man, aside from even going to heaven when I die, man, I'm thankful to be saved. Man, I love the grace of God. See, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Some say, man, you're a preacher and you've, you know, you started a church. These are some awesome things. I'm like, I am what I am by the grace of God. None of these things would have happened. No, there's no way. None of these, I would be in some rock band somewhere, probably lost my marriage. I mean, that's the road I was heading on just before I got saved, so I don't know. Maybe I would have still turned. Maybe it got super religious. And that would have been depressing too. But you think about it. Where would your life have gone? Where was it going? Or where was it when Christ came and saved you? Paul was in a terrible spot. He says, man, he was persecuting the church. He's like, I'm not even meet to be, uh, to be called an apostle. He says, man, I persecuted the church of God. Now I'm an apostle over the church of God. God goes, puts me in such a high position. And he says, man, but he's like, but it's by the grace of God. I didn't earn this in any way. He says, I don't, I don't deserve this at all. Well, we could all say that we don't deserve to be saved. We don't deserve to be, you know, happily married. We don't deserve to have healthy children. And I mean, there's, you can go through the list. We don't deserve what we deserve, but sometimes we, we, we complain and talk like as if we do because we forget. 
But just remind yourself, man, you are what you are because of the grace of God. If you're saved, and there's many reasons to just thank God. But Paul says, he says, I am what I am because of the grace of God. He says, but you know what? It wasn't useless. He says, and it sounds like bragging, but he said, it wasn't useless when, when God called me and made me an apostle. He says, I, I labored more. I just, I ran with it. I, I labored more than anyone, any, anyone else. He says, so it wasn't useless that God did that. But he says, but, I, but it's by the grace of God which was with me. He says, it wasn't just me. Again, don't think I'm just pointing at myself that, hey, I did this, I did that. He says, no, I'm, all these things that I'm doing, even laboring more than everybody else, he's like, I'm doing it because the grace of God, which is, was with me. He says, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. So his point is, I was the one who came and preached to you, and you believed, and you stood in this gospel. Now all of a sudden, you guys are denying the resurrection. What is going on? What happened? He says, you know what? And he gives his testimony a little bit and why he's still going on doing what he's doing. He says, by the grace of God. But he says, it doesn't even matter if I preach or Peter or James or who preached to you. He says, you believed. You said you believed the gospel. You said this was where you stood. And he says, what's going on? He says, therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so ye believe. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, this is weird how this could happen so early in the church. Like, even today, I don't know of churches that wouldn't preach the resurrection. I mean, they'd have to be something totally, we wouldn't call it a church. I mean, we wouldn't even deal with them. We wouldn't, we wouldn't go and, uh, we, we'd write them off as we know they're not saved. Right? They'd be so far out of the, out of the faith. It's, so Paul's dealing within the church. Like, I'm confident everybody here believes in the resurrection. You know, I, I'm like, there's nobody here that, I don't think this message is really for you that, hey, here's a rebuke for you that don't believe in the resurrection. But, so it's a little bit shocking. An early church like Corinthians had so much problems and there was people actually denying the resurrection. It's like the Sadducees were still around. Maybe someone said they got converted and they kept their hold. They don't believe in the resurrection. This is weird. This is strange. But he says, he says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. So this is still a great teaching for us because it tells you the importance of the resurrection. Your faith is vain with all, with all, without all three parts of the gospel, you could say. Death, burial, resurrection. In other words, he did die. Some people believe that Jesus didn't maybe all the way die. He was like, just kind of resting. No, he died. Like he, Jesus died. He didn't see corruption because think about it, before his body really started rotting, he, he rose. But think about it, he died all the way. He was dead. And then he rose from the dead. And it's crucial to believe that he did die for your sins, was buried. That's why we, when John talked about baptism, think about even the way we do baptism it's supposed to be showing his testimony. We would say, hey, what's your testimony? Well, you know what my testimony is? That I was living in sin, loving my sin. Somebody preached to me, it was super annoying. Then I started looking into it though. And, and I believed in Jesus' testimony. When I had enough proofs, enough things said to me, and it made, started making sense, and I researched and asked some questions, and all of a sudden it made sense to me. His testimony, his death, burial, resurrection. See, Jesus has a testimony. And we actually share his story, his testimony. And it's his testimony that I'm showing when I got baptized. When I got baptized, is hey, Christ died, buried, rose again for me. And when he did that, there's something on top of that, I died with him and was buried and rose, and, and I'm a new creature now. His experience became my experience, but it's really his story. It's his testimony his story. It's God's story. How God came flesh and died and was buried and rose again. That is the gospel. If you believe that with all your heart, that's salvation. So yeah, but what about, what about, um, you know, I've done some terrible things and I need to first, you know, clean this up a little bit. You can't get saved like that. I see people doing that kind of stuff. You hear from time to time, people think they can clean themselves up. Guys, that is as Dumb as trying, you break your arm and try to fix your arm, get it in the right place, put a cast on, and then go to a hospital. And did I do it right? Did I save my arm, doctor? <laughs> Leave it to the professionals. Leave it to somebody who's qualified to do it. You don't do that. You go in the worst 
terrible situation when you cannot fix yourself, when it's so bad you probably even get an ambulance, you even get a ride there, and then somebody else, a professional, fixes you. It's no different in the gospel. There's no different in salvation. Stop trying to get saved. I hear some people, they're trying to get saved. Oh, I'm trying. I want to be saved. You trying to get saved will actually keep you from getting saved. Because what does it even mean, trying to get saved? If you're trying to get saved, that means you're trying to do something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be trying. If you just sat back and read the scriptures, maybe believed, asked some questions, if you would just seek. Stop trying to get saved. Unless by that you mean, I'm seeking the Lord. I'm seeking, I'm trying to make sense of all this. That'd be different. But you usually ask people, and it's like, they've done things in their life, they're confused, and maybe I need to clean up a few things, and then I'm ready, and then I can present myself to the Lord. Hey, so I've cleaned myself up. What do you think? Am I worthy to be saved? You say, no, still going to kill you. you. Say, what? Yeah, you still got to die. So what he does is he takes you to, back 2,000 years and nails you to the cross. That's what he does. You died with Christ. That's the gospel. The moment you can believe that, you're saved. And if you keep in memory that, you'll stay saved. Believe it. If you're confident right now that you'll always believe that, then you can be confident you'll always be saved. Be confident, confident. Security of the believer. That's what I call it. That's what everybody calls it. And you can have that, but you got to believe. you got to keep on believing, and you got to believe in the death, burial, resurrection, and you got to keep that in memory. That's got to stick with you the rest of your life. That that's what it is, and it's his work, his work alone, his story, his, his doing. He's the great physician. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. It gets worse than that. He says, even us preachers are false witnesses. What we're preaching is false now, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. So if you're right and Christ's not raised up, then you're saying, I'm a liar and I'm a false witness of God. And this, just, this whole thing is a mess. It's a real big mess. He says, if it so be that the dead rise not. He says, for if the dead rise not, then Christ is not ra- raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you're yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perish. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all all men most miserable. Now, I don't think we can necessarily re- relate to that. But they're going, they were going through persecution and life was hard. I mean, the Christian life then was, it was hard. You were, you were persecuted for it. If you would stand up and preach anywhere, you're persecuted. And usually by the religious people, by Jews. And there's maybe a day coming. And you know what? That'll be probably the most miserable time for us Christians. There could come a time when Christianity is going to be very hard to stand, guys. It's not going to be fun anymore. I mean, I, I, I joined this because it seemed fun and love and peace and great community. And that's what, I, that's what I wanted. That's what I signed up for, most Christians would say. This persecution stuff, nah, and then they'll walk away. You're not standing in the faith then. I would say you're fake all along. Next one says you lost your salvation. But in the end, we both agree that you're not saved. You can just walk away. It says too hard. If, if hard times, perilous times come and that... That draws you away, you're fake. Paul says, what shall separate us from the love of God? He said, what shall separate us? And he goes through this list of just stuff that separates people from God. And he says, no, that's not going to separate us. Who's the us? Christians. That doesn't separate. Hard times don't separate us. If you're truly saved, that doesn't separate you, but it makes it miserable. He says, if we didn't have a resurrection, if all we got to do is try to live a joy, peace, love life here, and that's what Christianity is. That's all you get out of Christianity. And he says, this is useless. Then I've lived the most miserable life. Then Paul says, my life sucks. My whole life has sucked because we are men most miserable being persecuted. What am I doing this for? Just think about his point. He says, think about it. If I had your faith, I'm the most miserable person then. He says, in fact, we all are. All of us being persecuted, he says, most miserable. Like I said, we couldn't say that because we can, we can play a fake and still go to church and there's still benefits. You don't get persecuted, and there's still, you get a great community, and everybody treats you good and likes you, respects you. You have friends. I mean, you can be a fake Christian, and no big deal. When hard times come, you will quit. I'll say this. Mark it down. If you're a fake, when hard times come, you will quit. <laughs> you're bound to quit because you'll realize it's not worth it. Jesus is just not worth it. He never was. 
He never was, but he's worth this. I mean, he's worth community, and he's worth, you see what I mean? How much do you really believe? How much do you really love God? I mean, only hard times will show it. The only way I could prove it to you is go through hard times and stick through it. You say, man, now we know John Bold loves God. Until then, you can't know it. I'm just all words, right? So as of now, that's all we got. I mean, I'm not going to ask for persecution, right, just to prove myself. I don't care about proving myself that much, okay? But I'm saying that then you would know, and then we will know too. Who's, who's real? Who's fake? Somebody came in here and says, you have a chance to leave, or, we, or you stay and don't denounce Christ and we kill you all. Who would stay? Who would leave? I don't know. He says, I protest. Oh, let's actually go back a little bit. 22. For as in Adam, all die. This is where, I mean, if you have another translation, it probably doesn't say this. I didn't have the time to look this up, but this is where they really, commentaries will start messing the scriptures like crazy with verses like this. There's a belief out there today, and I'm sure there's somebody in here that has gone down this road, at least somewhere in your life, believe this. If not, you probably still believe this. So listen carefully. This is important, important doctrine. People think that when Adam died, or when Adam sinned, that he died spiritually. Because God said, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Well, then Adam and Eve ate from the tree. He didn't die physically, right? He didn't die right away. So people say, well, then that must be, and they came up to this conclusion that it must be that he spiritually died. Nowhere in the scriptures I've found, but that belief has dragged on. That somehow when Adam sinned, that now everybody, any, any kid that he was going to have was born spiritually dead. And therefore, now what does that equal? Spiritual death. That means you're already born a sinner. You have this nature to sin. And you cannot help it but just, just sin until you get saved. That's why a little kid, we just, I mean, five years old, try to get him saved because he's on his way to hell. Because he's born from sinful parents and now the kids bear the sins of the parents and, oh, wait, great, great, great. They, these sins are passed on because of this spiritual death is passed on because scripture talks about death being passed on. And they cannot believe it that it was physical death, right? Because Adam did not physically die when he ate. So there is a little bit, it takes a little bit of study. But something did die. What died actually the day Adam sinned? An animal. An animal had to die and shed his blood and take place. Something did have to die. So God, instead of killing Adam right away, had to, he started sacrifices. See, sacrifices started before the law. Adam, it, God taught Adam and Eve to start doing sacrifices. Abraham was doing sacrifices. See, this was before Moses' time. They were doing sacrifices. Who taught them to do that? And why? I've heard people say that, that are non-dispensationalists, that don't, they don't think there's no difference between Old Testament and New Testament, and people in the Old Testament got saved just like we do in the New Testament. Haven't done nearly enough study in their Bible to say that kind of nonsense. They, don't, they see the blood as kind of useless because Hebrews does say it could never take away the sins. So they say the blood was just a picture of when Christ would come and he would shed his blood and he would die. That was just a picture, like a shadow, kind of like the Sabbath was a shadow. That's not true. It was not just a picture. That blood temporarily covered their sin. It could not take it away, but it could be like shove it under the carpet for now. We're going to act like we don't see that sin right now, and I won't condemn you right now. And then when David died, he was a sinner. When he died, he went to paradise. He didn't go to hell. Why? Because he was covered on, by animal blood. People say, what? You think animal blood can take away sins? I didn't say that. See, you got to listen carefully to understand Bible doctrine. Animal blood never took away the sins. Like our sins are now taken away, washed away. They're gone, like they're dealt with. But they weren't exactly dealt with. They were temporarily, temporarily dealt with. Okay, does it make sense? There was a time that, yes, a Messiah would come and deliver them from their sins. They didn't know what that would look like. They didn't know how that was all going to work. They didn't know a king was going to come and he was going to die. They didn't, they didn't believe that at that time. If it took belief in the cross, then they all would have been lost. They didn't believe in a cross. Jesus coming and dying on a cross. They didn't believe that. How were they saved? Not like we are in the New Testament. 
think it through. It doesn't even make any sense at all, even thinking it through. There's not enough stuff in the Old Testament. To, yes, we have Isaiah 53 and the prophecies and stuff like that. You can see that Messiah was going to come. And many of them did not understand that Jesus' own disciples did not understand that. They, they tell you in the scripture they did not understand that. They would have been completely lost then. Now, they were safe as long as they followed Jesus. They were doing animal sacrifices like the Old Testament teaches. Okay, so Adam sinned. An animal had to die that day and take his place. Otherwise, Adam would have to die that day and go to hell. But an animal started covering his sin right there. And then what, what did happen is he was going to age and mortality came upon him. And guess what? He passed on to his kids. Mortality. They're all going to die. Maybe even had a stillborn. Maybe had a baby die. Right? Said, Why did that happen? Oh, God took our baby. God didn't take your baby. Sin took a baby. God doesn't just go and kill babies. God, God's not an abortionist, okay? God can let it happen, but don't blame God for tragedies that God is a giver of good things. Why do people say, well, I guess God wanted to take my mom out of this world? Sin did that. It's the curse of sin. God is not doing that kind of stuff. Him letting it happen is not doing it. It's, it people have such a Calvinist view of God that it becomes a very weird and really point the finger at God. I sinned today. It must be God's fault, my sinful nature. Where did I get my nature from? Well, God created it. In, in my mother's womb, God created me. So then, then uh, and he instilled the sinful nature because of what Adam did. You're saying God made me a sinner? So when I sin, whose fault is it then? Then it would be God's fault. Well, no, no, it's not God's fault. There's, you can beat around the bush and say whatever you want. It equals God's fault. If I'm born this way, if I'm born a homosexual, then it's not my fault. I'm born this way. We say, no, 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 you're, no, you're not. Something happened along the way. Decisions you made. It was on your own stupidity. Maybe even part of your parents training you up and putting you in public school and whatnot, eh? And having queer friends. I mean, that'll do it. I mean, not just public school alone, but just who are they with? That'll be huge. Oh, those things matter. Whose fault is it? When you die and go to hell, whose fault is it? It's your own fault. You will die and go to hell. Now, the thing is, you are born without God. You are born without God and need to be redeemed to God. But remember what Jesus said. He says, suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say they'll become, um, I want them to get saved. Uh, I, I, would really, yeah, I really want the children to be around me because I'm, I'm going to save them by default. He was saying that they are part of the kingdom of heaven. I remember, the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are different. If you're not a dispensationist, you'll again mess it up. They don't get automatic salvation. A child does not just, is not born, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and loses that seal when he goes and rebels as a teenager and then has to make a decision. Don't think that either. But in their ignorant state, they belong to God, they belong to Jesus but they're not sealed, born again like we are until they come to the knowledge of good and evil and make a decision. Make sense? This whole idea of the spiritual death passing on, then, if that is true, then you shouldn't even believe what you believe here. You should be in a Calvinist church somewhere that pre preaches that God has to come and call you before you get saved. Because if you're spiritually dead, then how can you go make any decision in your spirit right now? In your human spirit, that's lost and not regenerate yet, you can go and seek God and get saved. Calvinists tell us you cannot do that because you're spiritually dead. You're like a dead man's bones. You cannot hear God. God has to first come to you. And, and there's verses that kind of sound that way. He has to first come to you and, and give you life and show himself to you. So in other words, force you to get saved. I mean, it makes sense. If you're born spiritually dead, then God has to first come and push himself onto me before I can even see who he is and I'm dead. He needs to first make me alive so I can be alive to him, right? So then the Calvinists are right that salvation is actually God's doing and, and I mean, you can't make a decision. And if you're lost, then I mean, God just created you to be lost and if you're saved, then God created you to be saved. You see where that terrible doctrine comes from? All starts right back in the, your first book in the Bible where people can't understand that when Adam died. We're dealing with that right now. That that's, that's 
physical death. That mortality came upon him. And from then on, we all die in Adam. You say, I haven't even done any sin. Let's say if that's the case, you hadn't done any sin. Why am I still going to die? Oh, that's Adam's fault. That's because of Adam's sin, not even your sin. <clears throat> but if you also sinned on top of that, now there's two reasons why you're going to die. Your sin and your forefather's sins. You see that makes sense? That's what he's saying here. He's saying, in Adam, all die. In other words, your physical body you were born with, the first time you were born, not born again, not the second time, the first time you were born, which is your physical birth from your mom, says that that is in Adam. That's flesh. That's earthy. Okay? That's from the earth. And he says, and in that, you're going to have to drop. You're going to have to drop. Remember, we're talking about resurrection. We're talking about physical resurrection. So we're talking about physical death. We're not talking spiritual death here. In Adam, all die. He says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. In Adam, you're going to physically die. In Christ, you will be able to physically live. You'll be made alive. He says, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So Christ is the first. He is the resurrection. He's the first fruits. He's like, the best of, of it all. He says, but we're going to be after him at his coming. He says, when, it, when it's going to happen, at his coming. Then cometh the end. So after his coming, now I could preach a little pre-trib stuff here. Maybe I should give you a, a little bit of it. If it's chronologically in order, then think about it. You have a resurrection happening. And then he says, then, so what? After resurrection comes the end. He says, what shall when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So there's coming a time, rapture's going to happen, dead in Christ rise, we which are alive and remain, get caught up, we go be with Christ. Seven years of tribulation, he deals with the Jews, says all Israel yet be saved, I think it's the remaining that stay alive, and return to Jesus, run into wilderness, and great persecution goes on. Then comes the battle of Armageddon, Christ comes down, and kind of puts it all to an end at that point. But then there's a millennium. It's the end of as this world as we know it. Then he starts the millennium reign. A thousand year reign. And he's going to talk about this kind of stuff. Because that is actually the kingdom of heaven being put back into play. If you remember me preaching on the Matthew series. And you remember I talked a lot about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. And how they're different. It is very crucial to understand that. You're going to mess up a lot of doctrine if you do not get that. You're going to mess up salvation if you don't get that properly. If you don't understand that because you're going to take a lot of works that Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 6 and you're going to say that that is applied to the church and, and some will try to fit that in the church. Well, you're going to, you're going to end up with work for your, to, to keep yourself saved. It's just going to equal that. It's just going to equal that. You have to maintain your salvation and do this and do that. Everything Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 6. And if you don't do a good job of that, you'll lose your salvation because that's, that's what he says. But he was talking about the kingdom of heaven. He was still talking about when people were under the law. And he goes on to say, then the end will, will, will come and, and Jesus is going to give everything over to the Father. See, then at that point, God won't, be, won't need to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Let's put it that way. He doesn't need to be, like Jesus' work will be done. See, Jesus came into the flesh Think about before time. Now I'm going to get too deep in this. Think about before time. It says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. So the Word hadn't always been flesh, right? So at one point it became flesh, and I don't know. I'll say this. I don't know if that means that, okay, well, Jesus not have a physical body in the future and all that kind of stuff. I think we'll be able to physically see God. I do believe that you'll be able to see God. And I don't think he'll just be spirit. The Bible says God is spirit. I think you'll be able to see him still in a body. But think about it. There's a point in time coming when, when he says everything, Jesus will give everything over to the Father at the end. Right now, think about everything is through Jesus and, and the meteor. It, it, you can't just, and my point of this is you can't, what people want to do nowadays, you can't just go and say, okay, we all believe in God. We just call him by different names. It doesn't work. You can't, See, the Muslim faith will say, well, we just call him Allah. We, they believe in a one God. 
So what if their version of the one Jehovah true God is just all on the way they understand it? Well, that's just not good enough. You need to understand Jesus and his authority. Otherwise, you can't get to Allah, Jehovah, or whoever you think your main God is. Does that make any sense? It has to be. In other words, if you want to reject that Jesus was just some prophet, you're already on your, lost on your way to hell. It has to take to believe in Jesus, that God came in the flesh. His name was Jesus. He died, was buried, rose again. That is the only, now that is so narrow-minded. That is the only way of salvation. That offends, I mean, how much of religion out there? I mean, how much religion one day when they get a chance, they're going to want to kill a guy like me for saying that? That time is coming. You say that? You blaspheme against my God? Of course. Your God is a dead God. He's vain, useless. He's the devil shaped into that kind of God. I mean, he's just not God at all. There's no other gospel. One gospel. Do not bend, guys. Stand in the gospel. The gospel you've heard and believe. Do not bend. You say, well, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be loving. Well, I mean, if it comes to bending in the gospel, do whatever it takes. Do not bend. That's what I'm getting at. Do not bend. You need to stand and you stand firm. This is how it is. It's how it always will be. I believe this once. I will always believe it. In other words, never change. And belief in Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection is the only thing, and salvation is the only thing that ever will be equal salvation. Don't ever move. Don't ever bend. Anything that sounds different, that's not, question it and look into it. Yeah, but you got to, what faith is dead without works? Why are you putting a button there already? I already know that faith is dead if you have no works to prove it. Like I said, I can't prove it that I really love God until I get persecuted, right? I can't prove myself to you until I get like a little bit of persecution. But why people want to throw that verse to you is because they're saying that's not true and here's why. They don't understand the gospel then. Do not bend. Listen and correct people. Get, be ready to give an answer. I would say study the scriptures. Know where you stand. That way you can stay standing. That way you don't bend. Make sure your election to call. Make sure it's the real deal. And then you will stand. And you'll be able to stand because nobody will be able to move you on that. Don't let anybody move you on that. He says, For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him that God may be all in all. He says, so when's the end? Then he's just, it's going to be just God again. He says, and when all things shall be subdued, I said that verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, the only other religion I know that does this is Mormons. This is the only time the scripture says this. We have no idea. Was the church doing this? Were they supposed to be doing it? I don't believe they were supposed to because I think we'd have more in scripture. There'd be some kind of command. Like Peter commanded Cornelius' house to be baptized. Never commanded him, hey, let's right away uh, take one for your dead relatives. (laughs) I mean, they never did that. He didn't say we should do that. He was questioning a false doctrine of why do you guys say there's no resurrection? So here's my conclusion on this, because there's not much to go off of, is that these same people, there was probably people among them that also were baptizing for the dead. I mean, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They took communion wrong. They did a whole bunch of things. The Corinthians was a really messed up church. So they had somebody doing it, and he says, okay, then why are they? Who's the they? I don't know. He didn't say us. Then why are we? If he said that, well, then why do we baptize for the dead? That would be different. That would raise a whole new thing. That would kind of tell us, okay, that means we should be doing it. You had a person that was saved and died and didn't have a chance to get baptized? Okay, I'll do it in his name. And it would be weird. We don't do that. Mormons do that kind of stuff. We don't do that because baptism doesn't equal salvation. So we look at it as kind of, it'd be irrelevant anyway. Now, he never said to do it. He never said that they were, as the Christians were doing it. He says, well, you guys that believe this, then why would somebody even, so supposedly people that didn't believe in the resurrection, but they were doing something like baptizing for the dead. Why would you do that if there's no resurrection? So I think he was calling them out on some of their contradictions. Like I said, how I've seen NIV contradict itself. Sometimes you can do that and say, okay, you say this, but how come you didn't translate that word over here like that? Like I find fault in their translation. I say, 
Okay, here you want to translate it that way, a popular verse to teach sinful nature, but how come you didn't translate flesh here when Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh? Why didn't you say he came in sinful nature? Oh, because then it wouldn't fit. Oh, okay. So why start changing words? Because you know Jesus didn't come in, he wasn't sinful. He didn't, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Well, why don't you change a word there too? You see what I mean? When I see inconsistencies, now Paul's calling it the same thing. You're not consistent. You say, okay, you, you don't believe in the resurrection. Then why are you doing all these other things, like baptizing for the dead? So this is not something that uh, I think the church should pick up or do at all. He's just calling him out on this. He says, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Why are we being persecuted? Every hour, somebody wants to kill us. He says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. People think this is spiritual death again. Has he been talking about spiritual death at all so far? He's been talking about resurrection, right? I mean, the context is you'll physically die and then one day you'll rise up. And people didn't want to believe that. They would rise up and live again, right? He says, listen, I'm dying daily. Now, he wasn't actually dying daily, just like he was saying, hey, pray without ceasing. Okay, there's verses like that that say, okay, should you just do nothing else but pray all the time? And then you could say, okay, well, your life is a prayer and those kind of things. And, but let, we can count that kind of stuff, but think about it. It doesn't necessarily right away mean exactly that. If you're going to allegorize and spiritualize something, here's probably the time to do it. Because obviously he wasn't dying every day, but pretty much every day he was ready to die. He says he carries his cross. He's ready to die every day. See, even the idea that Jesus asked his disciples, all right, pick up your cross, follow me. People have taken that as a, a spiritual term. Well, we don't pick up a literal cross and, and go and die. So, oh, picking up your cross is picking up your hard times and just sticking through it and during the hard times. We call that pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Totally inappropriate to scripture, guys. That's not the context of scripture. He was actually challenging his disciples to come and die with him. And later, Peter did die on a cross. And later, most of them died, not on a cross, but he said at the time, die with me. They all, what they do? They booked it. They ran. And Peter denied Jesus. I mean, they were scared, and he knew they would do that. He was going to die alone. But the challenge was, hey, you want to follow me? Follow me unto death, guys. I mean, Jesus would have been really impressed with that. Hey, when they put me in court, come with me. Don't be embarrassed that you're my friends. Let's all die together. Let them kill us all. He was talking physical death. And people say today, oh man, I just got this hard thing. I'm going through that. I, just, my, I guess it's just my cross to bear. As if God laid up a cross on somebody and just, here, just bear this thing because I enjoy watching you bear hard times. That's why when their baby dies or something, it's just my cross to bear. No, you live in a sinful world. Death happens. It's sinful. One day that's not going to happen. In a millennium, that's not going to happen. You see? These things... They happen because of sin. And I mean, you could be driving recklessly down the road. Some drunk driver could probably drive recklessly and kill you, kill your family and say, wow, this is, I mean, terrible things happen. God didn't do that. Don't ever point the finger at God. God let it. He could have maybe stopped you. He could have protected you. Thank God that he has so far intervened and probably protected you in times. But don't blame God when tragedies do happen. That's what people want to do. It's, it's not God's doing. And the whole thing of dying is talking physical death. You got to see the time that they were living in. He wasn't talking, I die daily. Well, he wasn't physically dying every day. So that means, like Adam, um, it's spiritual death. He was spiritually saying, I'm dead to, well, he was fleshly trying to kill himself. People have this idea, crucify the flesh daily. That's what the terms they picked up. Guys, whew, I just got to rip on that a little bit. That is so false gospel. And you say, why do you call it gospel? Because it ain't good news at all. That, that's saying that Christ did not do it, did the job well enough. If you got to go and die daily yet, like these crucifying the flesh, because your flesh just so badly wants to sin, and I got to put it to death every day. What you're saying is you have no victory in Christ, and Christ, I mean, he saved you, but I, he couldn't do anything more than that. That's as far as it went. I mean, I, well, actually, you're saying I got to do all this yet, and then it will count for something. Like, um, do your best and God will do the rest. Have you heard sayings like that? Like that will equal salvation. That is a works-based salvation, guys. That is a, a perverted gospel. 
It is, and I know it could even offend people, but guys, it's true. I have to say, it's perverted. Show me that it's not perverted. It's a perverted gospel. I am all for works after salvation. I mean, walk in perfection, walk in holiness, be righteous. Absolutely. I'm not down talking, you know, I'm not saying go liberal or what I'm saying is, yes, be righteous, be real. But this whole idea, you'll read so many commentaries and stuff like that, this whole die daily, they'll go into this whole spiritual death. You got to crucify the flesh. Get up early. I know you don't want to get up early. Get up early, read your Bible. That's a good thing to do. But they think that's dying daily. They think this is somehow getting closer to God. Like, more of salvation or keeping your salvation. It does not do that. Then it is by your own works that you're keeping yourself saved or in the end being saved. You are mixing works and grace. Go read a whole book called Galatians on this kind of stuff, how Paul tears this down. They're called Judaizers, people that come in and bring Jewish rules to the church. And you say, we don't have that. Oh, yes, we do. Every church has this. From time to time, there's Everybody, I got people online trying to push me into Judaism. Saying you got to keep Sabbath or you got to do this or you, you got to take Christ's teaching. The very fact that you would say that Matthew is not Old Testament, you still got to hearken to like Jesus' teaching to the church. Like in other words, Matthew 5 and 6, that's still, we're still under that. You see, it sounds bad because it sounds like I'm saying, don't listen to what Jesus said in the Bible. That's what people paint me with. You're not listening to what Jesus says in the Bible. You think that what Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, that's all just different dispensation. You don't need to listen to that. And, and it sounds so heretical. It sounds so, you just follow Paul and you don't even care what Jesus or anybody else has to say. That's a hyper dispensationalist, they'll say. And it sounds terrible when they said that way. I do. I went thoroughly through what Jesus taught. But you put it in the right dispensation. Why he said it, where he said it, how he said it. And when he said to the kingdom of heaven, think about it, then it's for that kingdom. Of course, I listened to exactly what he said, exactly where he said it. But you mix up kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, what are you doing? You're taking Jesus' teaching, you're putting law. Five and six is full of laws. So much so that all you guys are guilty of it. Why are you living in houses and drive vehicles? Every one of you should sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Didn't Jesus say that? And come follow me. Pick up your cross, follow me. You want to live under that? You're not a dispensationalist, all right? Then stop being a hypocrite. Sell everything you have, your house, car, take all your equity, take your net worth, everything you got, give it to the poor. I don't care about this. My heart, it doesn't belong to this money. I don't care about that money. We all do care about our money and our houses and our cars. Our heart is there. Jesus says, you have anything, your heart's going to be there. He said it. It's inevitable. You cannot. The proof of it is sell it and give it away if you don't care about it anyway. The fact that you won't sell and give it away shows you that your heart's there. You're attached to it. You don't want to sell it. I like my house. I like my acreage. It's for my kids. It's not for me. It's for my kids. You say, well, at least my heart's not there. Jesus said, if you have it, then your heart's there. He didn't say, hey, just make sure you don't put your heart there. He said, if you have it, your heart will be there. So own nothing. You tell me you're not a dispensationalist? You're saying that you're doing that? Then you should go go among the Hamas and go preach the gospel to them. Sell everything you have, take your whole family, pack up, go to Israel, and go try to preach in Gaza. Then I'll believe you that you're not a dispensationalist. And I'll say, wow, his works proves. These other people, a bunch of two-faced hypocrites. Don't understand the Bible. Say one thing, believe it, walk another. If I believe Jesus was actually teaching that kind of stuff, I mean, that people try to mix this. We're all a bunch of hypocrites then, big-time hypocrites. None of us are doing what Jesus actually said to do. None of us. I said, I never thought of it that way. No, we didn't want to think about it. We knew he said it, and we just didn't know how to make sense of it, and then we ignored that he said it. I'm not doing it anyway. Right? But I have a reason why I'm not doing it. Because <laughs> I see it a different dispensation. I see it as the New Testament people did own stuff. But I do see a, okay, try not to be so attached to it. When it really comes to help a brother in need, don't just, be, don't just do everything for yourself. I preach that kind of stuff, but you will do things for your family. You will be a carnal man, in a sense, a little bit, if you have a wife and kids. You're going to think of couches and houses and, and decent vehicles and stuff. Why? Because you have a family. and I mean, you have to care about these things. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a good family life. And the Bible tells you to do that. You need to be about the cares of the world because you have a wife. That's why Paul says, don't get married. It's not a good idea because you have to care about the world then. So all of us that got married and stuff, and I highly recommend it, you have to care about the world. 
You care about your marriage. You care about your cars. Your wife cares about the couches and the blinds and the, everything else, the paint on the wall. And you care about it. Happy wife, happy life. You care. I mean, you're far from Jesus' teaching, though. You're far from his teaching. So I just proved it. You're a dispensationalist. And that goes to people online as well. And that was my point. But this whole dying, understand this as well. This whole dying, stop trying to kill yourself, okay? Stop being suicidal here. You don't need to kill yourself. Christ already killed you. The gospel is this. I'm not even going to make it through this. We're going to close with this. The gospel is this, that literally 2,000 years ago, Christ died, was buried, rose again, and he took you with him. The moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, his history, his testimony becomes your testimony. Your testimony is, when you get saved, is that Jesus died for me and washed all my sins away. They're not covered. They're not pushed under the carpet. They are gone. And you say, which, which sins? All sins. So all the sins I've done? Oh, better than that. All the sins you're going to do. Past, present, and future sins are gone. I mean, that's the gospel. See, that is a mighty gospel. That is a mighty grace. How, how can you say these things? Because by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am saved, bought by the blood on my way to heaven, and I know it. I know that I know that I know where I'm going. So you can't say that you're prideful. It would be if I did it. If I did it like a religious person that's trying to keep themselves saved, riding a horse, I'm keeping the reins on the narrow track. Don't fall off. Don't fall off. Come on, family. Keep the track. Oh, lost one kid. Oh, shoot. Oh, we got I just had to put a little humor in there, but think about it, guys. You say, that's what people are doing. What have you done? Your gospel is literally watered down. It's not my gospel. It's not Paul's gospel. It's not what happened to me. My past, present, and future sins are gone, washed away. And if I ever doubted that, then I would know I'm on my way to hell. Think about it. And you say, if you ever had any doubt, what I'm saying is, if I doubt it right now, oh man, are all my sins gone? Did Jesus really put, I'm not believing. You say, what is gospel? You need to believe. Think of this. When this finally made sense to me, when Security Believer was first preached to me, it was so hard for me to get. What do you mean? You can just do what you want and be, still be saved? It didn't make sense because I knew that wasn't true. <laughs> I, there was too much scripture saying, you know, you got, you're supposed to live good, you know, and Christians live good. So, I mean, what are the world saying that you can just be saved no matter what? When all of a sudden dawned on me that, listen guys, secure the believer, believing that you're secure in your faith, I say it this way, most of the cases, let's put a little grace on it. Majority of the cases, that equals salvation. The reason why some of you are probably not saved and you're trying to get saved is because you don't believe in security believer. Yeah, really. Yeah, because think about it. What you're trying to do is arrive to some kind of point to get saved, and then you're going to stay, try to stay there. But if you could just arrive to the belief that it's done in that past, present, future sin, security believer is done, it's paid, it's finished at the cross, it equals salvation. Believing that your past, present, and future sins are gone and nobody can do anything about it. Nobody can pluck you out of your father's hand, right? Think about it. That is salvation. That is what I'm asking people to believe. That is what I preach. That's the gospel. That is the good news. It's an amazing great news. That is the grace. You say, well, well why would he do this? Because he loves you. I mean, there's just nothing else. He just loves you. He loved the world. He's seen it in sin, but he loved the people and said, I want, it's God's will that none should perish. Why are people going to perish? Because they're own stupid. Not because of Adam and sinful nature. That doesn't even make sense. Then God's will is, why is God's will not being done? It's God's will. He already said he wanted everybody saved. It's not happening. Why? Because people cannot believe death, burial, resurrection, that that is a finished work and that that's all it takes. Just too good to be true. It sounds like a sales pitch that you should run from because too good to be true. I mean, if it was just, if, I mean, if it wasn't the Bible, it wasn't scripture, I would run from it too. I did for years. I ran from it. And people still run from it because it's just too good to be true. And I tell you what, it is, man, it is, it is just so good, but it is true. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your grace, your mercy, and the love you've shown us, Lord. We know you love us, and Lord, we love you back. Lord, those of us in here or anybody listening that just can't make sense of it and is confused and sees all kinds of fault. I'm sure there, there is that. 
or help them to understand and help me to, to explain it better. Um, maybe the next time we preach or Lord, to be ready to give an answer just to, so it makes sense of it, Lord. But that people wouldn't just leave and, and keep this confusion in their head or walk up in a stuck-up way and think they know it all. Lord, when we get caught up in pride like that, Lord, it just keeps us in a terrible spot. Lord, help us all to be humble. Humble to your word, humble to the authority. Lord, we all just want to believe this book and believe it accurately. Help us to do that. Help us to love one another, even when we disagree. Help us to not be doing the things that the Corinthian church was caught up in. And help us to stand. I know times might get tough, and we're not used to it. We're not ready for that kind of stuff. Lord, we haven't been persecuted in any way, really. And if it was to come our way, it would be really tough. Help us to get ready for that kind of stuff. Help us to, to know where we stand, know what we believe, and to just go out in the world and preach it with boldness and make the gospel available to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.